Welcome back to another episode of the Diabetes Survival Guide Show. I'm your host, Patrick, with the Diabetes Management Group, and I am joined by the amazing, the wonderful Aureli Gutierrez. So not only has Aureli inspired people of color to take control of their health, to improve their health and manage their diabetes, but she's also someone who really cares about learning more about where is the individual coming from? What is your background? What can I help you with? And listening to them. Not a lot of people actually take the time to listen to people, but Aureli, she has probably the biggest ears of them all to actually listen to what's going on and then provide solutions that works best for the individual and the person. She also loves giving back to the profession of uh, dietetics and nutrition by serving as a, a communication coordinator and is also the director elect for the nutrition and dietetics like community and especially for the uh, Latinos and Hispanics in nutrition and dietetics. So she's very knowledgeable in the field, very active in the community, and I'm so honored to have her on here as a guest. And without further ado, Areli, please uh, share more about yourself, tell us about yourself, and share the things that I wasn't able to mention in your introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Patrick. I, I might need to, to copy that for a future bio. That was <laughs> <laughs> you made me sound awesome. You are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, like you mentioned, I would say my biggest superpower is probably being a good listener, having that level of empathy to help the patients. Absolutely. I'm a first generation Mexican American registered dietitian. And <clears throat> originally, when I was in college, I had no idea I was going to go into the nutrition field. I just knew that. Um, I liked chemistry and I was just going around taking biochem and okay, all the things and looking at what my possibilities were. And it just so happened that I myself had that, what, freshman 10, freshman 15, and I was starting to learn about nutrition for myself. And when I realized just how heavily focused it was as far as anatomy and chemistry, I was like, this is for me. This is my jam. You're telling me. I can learn all these things and help people improve their health without having to rely as much on medicine. That sounds amazing. So that's how I ended up choosing that dietetics track. Now, I will tell you, someone coming from a lower social economic background, it was a super huge challenge getting into the dietetics field because a lot of dietetic internships, you have to pay for them. So on top of having to pay for your bachelor's and your master's, you also have to pay just to get into the internship. And it was super hard to match um, because I told myself the only way I can make this happen is if I get into a, an internship that's paid and those were so rare so it literally took me maybe three or four years to be able to get into a, a, an internship that I could and even with that even being a paid internship I still had to work multiple part-time jobs so that's a big challenge I think to have more dietitians of color enter the field because when you finish college, if you get to go to college, when you finish college, you think, okay, I need to start working because I need to support my family. A lot of us have to take care of our elders. So we just don't have the luxury to only look out for ourselves and we go straight into working so we can start providing for the family. So just a lot of barriers as far as uh, becoming a dietitian, but that's why it's so important to me, like you mentioned, to give back to my profession, especially to dietitians of color because I know how hard it was. So I go out of my way to try to serve the community as much as I can. Currently, I'm involved in La Giran, so that's Latinos and Hispanics in Nutrition and Dietetics. And with that community, it's one, it's really nice to connect with other dietitians that are Hispanic because we are so rare. But two, I really like talking to the students and just helping guide them so that in the future, there can be more of us and we can better serve our community and our population. I am getting so many chills right now, especially when you talked <laughs> about being a first generation, lower socioeconomic status and really showing people that, hey, even though there are a lot of difficulties, barriers and challenges, I'm still going to make this work. Like I'm still going to become a dietitian. I'm going to use the knowledge that I learned from my chemistry classes, anatomy, and physiology classes to make an impact on people to let them know that, hey, you can improve your health by focusing on improving your nutrition without having an over-reliance on the medications. And to that is really meaningful and impactful. And it also reminds me of my current situation where I'm also first generation, low socioeconomic status. And for our clinical rotations, 
we have to pay for the like lodging in case if we need to go to a different spot, we need to pay for our own transportation to get there and also making the investment to pay for the credit hours for the university in order to receive the credit hours in order to pass that clinical rotation of that internship. So definitely can empathize with those on those situations and also taking care of our family members too, because every time I get on a conversation with my parents and my siblings are like when are you going to graduate so you could start pay like contributing to the family because we're not in a good spot you're the old like you're one of the only people that once you graduate like we can actually start having equal footing and it's tough because I'm more like the second oldest in my family and it's like the older uh folks like we have to start doing things a lot quicker we don't have as much of that leeway or that break compared to our younger siblings so you can definitely understand the stressors that goes along with it <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, Areli, what got you involved with working with people with kidney dysfunction? What inspired that? Oh, great question. So once I finally became a dietitian, actually one of my first jobs was working at a max security prison. The way it works in North Carolina is that they don't send out offenders into different hospitals. They built their own hospital in the state prison, and anyone who has cancer, diabetes, who's on dialysis, they all come to the max prison. So we had two dietitians to serve thousands of offenders. And I saw anything and everything you can think of. So a lot of gut shunt wounds, stabbings, people with mental health issues that would hurt themselves. So in all of that, <laughs> I think I very quickly learned what I did and I didn't like. So I realized I really did like the acute setting or the more challenging settings, but I liked when you had the chance to build, not build report, but be able to figure things out. And sometimes you can't do that on a first visit, right? So ultimately, I ended up really liking the dialysis part, especially because it's so lab heavy and it's the medications that you have to learn and how they interact with nutrition. That part is so important. And I really like that. So when I moved to Texas, I ended up working at DaVita and I just really loved the balance of it because it is very clinically challenging, but at the same time, you get a lot of room for trial and error when it comes to helping someone with their diet. So we can, if they're struggling with their phosphorus, they're struggling with potassium, there are 10, 15 different things that could be causing it. And so when you have time to see them week after week, you can address, okay, Maybe it wasn't the drinks you were having. Maybe it's the snacks you were having. Let's play with this. No, labs came back. That wasn't it. Maybe let's talk to the doctor about the medications a little bit. Okay. And you can just keep working on it until you figure it out. So I, I did really love that aspect of it. Oh, gosh, that is crazy. It sounds <laughs> like you're in playing detective mode to figure out, okay, what's going on here? How can we improve your health? How does these different factors affect your blood work and your lab values and what changes can we make so that we can improve those markers for the next lab result or figure out what is it going to happen on there to see if it has a net positive effect or a net neutral and trying to figure out how they can give them the information so they're more informed about what affects their body and how they can do a better job in taking care for it right yes exactly and Another thing that I really liked about working in dialysis is that there are such few Spanish speaking renal dietitians and so many Hispanic patients or patients from South America that need to see a Spanish speaking renal dietitian. So whenever I would start at a clinic and there were Spanish speakers, like you could just see the relief in their eyes because they've gone so long, they have so many questions and there's really not someone that can properly address it. Um, because even when you have a, a translation line, the translator doesn't understand dietetics. So they do their best to try to explain what the doctor is saying, but they don't really know what a starch is versus, you know, what. So it's just a lot more confusing to use a translator, but obviously a lot of clinics do what they can with what they have. But just being able to have a Spanish speaking dietitian. There's just a lot of patients that were able to better express like their struggles and to ask the questions that they needed to get the information. But again, knowing that there's such few of us, that is really what made me start my Instagram because I can only reach one or two clinics. That's what my sense is, but there's so many 
Spanish speaking dialysis patients that need this type of education. So that's really when I started putting more information, just general information out there um, and made myself a resource um, if people were interested in learning more. Mm. Mm -hmm. So awesome that you found, hey, I want to share more information to the people who are out there, the Spanish speaking uh, populations who need this resource or need to learn more about it and deciding, hey, let's make this broadcast on a worldwide basis. That's very awesome. <laughs> Yes, especially considering the lack of cultural inclusion that I see sometimes. Since most, a lot of doctors, a lot of dietitians, they're not being able to relate to the Hispanic population because they themselves are not Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Um, they struggle with making appropriate recommendations. And especially in chronic kidney disease, previously the thinking was very black and white. no tomatoes, no potatoes, no X, Y, and Z because it contains potassium, because it contains phosphorus. Not explaining to the patient that it's not the, like the food doesn't suddenly become poisonous once you have chronic kidney disease. It's just a certain nutrient that we have to be careful about, but that doesn't mean you have to eliminate it altogether. It's just, that's like lazy education, right? It's just saying, cut this out. It's teaching the patient like, How can they include it in what portions, what's appropriate for them? And then everyone's needs are different. You have some patients on PD or peritoneal dialysis. They need a lot more potassium versus someone who has hemo. And then someone who's not on dialysis that just has chronic kidney disease, they don't even really need to be on a potassium restriction most of the time. So they're just hearing all this conflicting information and it really takes a toll on them to be told, no, you can't have your cultural foods. And so that part is really important for me to explain to them that, no, you don't have to completely cut out foods, but let's make a plan as far as how we can safely include them. I loved hearing that. Let's show you how to have it and understanding the complexities of what your type of kidney failure is, because some of them, it might be a deficiency in potassium. Some of them it might be uh, too much potassium. And how can we assess the appropriate amounts and empowering them and educating them to have that? And I can totally empathize with you there for the black and white thinking versus what's the spectrum thinking, because from my perspective, an analogy that I like to use for folks is with like kidney disease and the different spectrums that Arely has talked about of, oh, it could be like peritoneal, it could be hemodynamic or different aspects of how your kidney is functioning. It's very similar to if someone has a cut, like just a small paper cut, or someone has like a major traumatic event for their finger. And then if the solution is, oh, let's eliminate it. So it's like amputation right off the bat, no matter what that spectrum is, it's that's pretty dramatic, isn't it? And Mm-hmm. that's a similar thing from my perspective, whenever a health provider says, oh, eliminate this food from your diet entirely. Like, to me, that's the don't quite know how to translate how to articulate and care for that cut. Instead, their option is let's just cut it off. And I'm just like, Ugh, it's not a good time because It's better to just understand it and provide the necessary and appropriate tools to empower the person to go with the right care and improve their health, right? Yes, absolutely. And especially if they have diabetes and a lot of my patients with kidney disease have diabetes, they get told, for example, if they're Hispanic, they get told, oh, you, you need to stop eating tortillas. You need to stop eating sweet bread. You need to stop eating this. And that's not realistic, one. And two, that's not true. Like you, your body still needs carbs, even if you have diabetes or not, or kidney disease or not. Yes, coming in and trying to correct all that misinformation is Is a big part of the job. Yeah. So what would you say is a common misconception that a patient brings to you? And how would you go about dismantling that and educating them on here's more of the updated information on this? Absolutely. I think a big one is the way that a lot of fruits and vegetables that are high in potassium get villainized and they're told that they need to cut them out. For example, avocados, just as an example. Avocado, yes, it, it is a higher potassium vegetable, but I show them a video where you have the avocado in different portions and how much each portion is as far as potassium. So 
I explained to them, it's not the same as having the whole avocado versus if you're putting like a slice or two on top of your tacos or tostadas, right? That's a lot more doable. Or keeping in mind that, okay, if you're going to have a food that's higher in potassium in certain items, let's say if on these tostadas, you're also putting tomatoes, then okay, let's back off a little bit on the avocado or pick one or the other. So let's focus on that one higher potassium item that you want in there or two, find the appropriate portion and then pair that with a lot of lower potassium items to keep things balanced. And that's and that goes the same for everything, right? For phosphorus or if they're diabetic for their carbs and you just kind of balance things out. Oh, I love how you just sit them down and say, hey, we're not going to eliminate this entirely. If you still love this, here's how we're going to do it. It's a math situation of it's not like a all or nothing where if you have one slice of an avocado that it's equivalent to an entire avocado. It's you no, know, just this little bit going to be fine and you can put that with the tostada so you can have that delicious meal instead of thinking i have to eliminate everything entirely and throw it out the window because it's high in potassium rather than no it's figuring out how can we play the math game and dividing things up so we can fit it into what we're having yeah and great it's, it's insights really challenging <laughs> It's really challenging because they've heard for so long that they can't have oranges or potatoes, all the things. So coming in and telling them, no, yes, you can. For some of them, they feel relieved. And for some of them, they're like, no, I don't want to mess with it. I'm just too scared. So they're not ready um, to let go of that fear that they've developed from hearing it so many times. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it'll, it's still a constant work in progress. How do you help someone who has that fear and being able to dismantle that? I think like you mentioned, I really get into the, the math of it. So I explain to them, okay, for the average dialysis patient, you can still have about 2000 milligrams of potassium in a day. That means we can still have this much for meal or this much for snack. So if this is the type of food that you wanna have and that portion has this amount of potassium, then you're fine. It still fits within what we're aiming for. And mm -hmm. that sometimes helps. But for a lot of them, it's just going to be like over time, like that reinforcement or like maybe they start adding a little bit of beans to their food and we check their labs and see, did anything happen? No. Okay. You can do a little bit more. So having that time to play around with it, that's what really helps. Mm, sounds good. Just gradual exposure, gradual positive reinforcement and showing them here's the numbers and let's be smart about the numbers. And then if they still don't believe it, using those lab values to say, Let's experiment and see. And then if it doesn't change that much, then like, see, we're doing good. <laughs> exactly. Oh, goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, mm -hmm. I know you have an awesome podcast called the Food Culture Curious Podcast. I was wondering what inspired you to make that podcast? Yes, absolutely. I think because of my own experience with just how challenging it is to have a kidney diet that's culturally inclusive, I... Similarly, wanted to learn more about other cultures so that I could make their kidney diet culturally inclusive. And then I realized that spreads to every single type of diet that we have. So whether that's IBS or diabetes specifically, like everyone would benefit, especially uh, since most dietitians are not dietitians of color. A lot of healthcare professionals would benefit of learning about different cultural foods and how you can work with the patient as far as like the examples that I just gave you. I still have dietitians that to this day who are not kidney dietitians that'll ask me, how can you, how can you encourage patients to eat tomatoes? How can you encourage patients to eat bananas? Isn't that dangerous? And then, and it's no, let me show you. Let me show you one. Yes, it's doable. And two, this is very important for people of my culture. So Having all of that, I wanted to learn more about different cultures. And in Davida, there's so many, at least in Houston, thank God. In Houston, there's dietitians of different backgrounds. So I asked them, okay, would you be open to having just a discussion with me about your cultural foods and how you would help someone of your population with their kidney diet? And then from there, um, I started interviewing other backgrounds and having people reach out to me on Instagram that they wanted to be on the podcast interviewed them about their cultural backgrounds and their niches, which are so different. Some of them is women's health. It's just 
the variety goes on forever and ever. So I just really like learning about all these different cultural foods and being able to ask them questions and improve my own knowledge so that I can be a better dietitian. And whoever's listening can also be a better healthcare professional and helping people of different backgrounds. Wow. Y'all, mm -hmm. Aureli is a superstar. Having people reach out <laughs> to her, hey, can I please be on your podcast so I could share what my stuff is? And Aureli's also amazing because she's continually growing and using that as a way to share the things that she's learning, to share the guests who are sharing their expertise and knowledge, and just letting people know and understand, hear, see, feel, and really get involved with how diverse food culture really is. And it's a pleasant, abundant rainbow of how can we incorporate these different things of bananas, tomatoes, different recipes, and still having a good time with it, rather than thinking we have to completely eliminate each and every single one of the ingredients or foods or dishes entirely to try and fit this mold that is, in my opinion, really outdated. And we should just throw that model away and focus on implementing this newer one of how can we be smart with these different things and having a holistic approach, really following the different social determinants of health of what's their finances looking, what's their culture looking, what's their different backgrounds, really taking everything as the whole picture instead of forcing something to fit into this one size fits all box. Yes, it's something that I mentioned in one of my episodes that when I was studying nutrition, because I didn't see that cultural inclusion at the time, I thought that my foods were unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had to switch over to eating grilled chicken and uh, brown rice and, and broccoli, which like, <laughs> yeah, not a typical Mexican meal. Yes. So it really did take time and learning more about different foods and how foods work together and realizing, no, my cultural foods are already healthy. Of course, we can modify recipes and include some foods more than others, but that nutrient density was already there. That's how my culture survived for generations and generations. <laughs> yeah, I really want to spread that awareness to healthcare providers and patients everywhere. That's good. I'm super happy we're on the same mission of, hey, everyone, like these cultural foods are not awful or horrendous. And it's actually really good. It's just being smart about them in different ways. Mm -hmm. I, I was working with a client last week and she was explaining how I know Mexican food is bad, but then I challenged her and said, what exactly is bad about Mexican food? What are you, what are the components that they're eating? And she's like, I'm eating the beef with it. I'm eating the like corn tortillas. I'm eating the beans on there. I'm like, isn't bean rich in fiber and protein? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, isn't beef also high in protein that we need? And she's also, yes. And I'm like, corn tortillas, do you know how much fiber is in a corn tortilla? And she's like, I'm not sure. I'm like, it's a pretty good amount, actually. So then when we broke it down by the, each of those ingredients, she took a second and thought, oh my goodness, Mexican food is good for me. Like it, it's packed yeah. with fiber, it's packed with protein. Like you get a decent amount of carbs too that it makes this good balanced meal. And for people to say that it's awful and bad, I'm like, let's break it down to the science. What are the nutrition highlights for each of them? What are the different macronutrients? What's the micronutrients? And once we look at that, it's a pretty good spectrum, they realize, oh, it's actually not bad for me. Like it's actually good for me. Then I'm just like, exactly. Can't be going in with this preconceived motions. Like let's look at the numbers and then let's go from there because nothing's really bad or good. It's just a matter of how can we fit the different macronutrient needs that we need and mm -hmm. how can we find the appropriate food sources and ingredients to fit them all together to achieve the goals that we're looking for our health. Yes, that was a beautiful way to put it. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Areli, what is your best success story with a client? I want to say it's not one major success, but more like a thousand mini successes. I've been in dialysis almost five years now, and I've had, gosh, I don't know how many patients at this point. And it's always something that maybe other people might think is minor, but is very important to them and can really help in the long run. Just to give a few examples would be patients. I have a, a Hispanic patient that 
really wanted to have Mexican hot chocolate, right? And then hot chocolate uh, or chocolate in general already has some phosphorus and potassium to it. So they'd already been told, no, you can't have hot chocolate. No, you can't have Mexican hot chocolate. So be able to talk to them and explain, actually, this portion one is okay. And two, there are different brands of Mexican hot chocolate. Some of them have added phosphorus, which we really encourage that they avoid because it's so highly absorbable. And some brands don't. So just being able to educate them on the brands and saying, okay, let's choose this brand and let's have this portion. And then yes, you can have your Mexican hot chocolate and something like that is just, to them is so meaningful. And if we can do that and it doesn't impact their numbers then they're great. And I think just those little interactions that I have with them every day, being able to address their needs and and make the kidney diet more sustainable for them is what's really, that's what's really meaningful for me. Mm. Sustainability. I'm sure everyone's heard that. I'm sure everyone really saw that message, really felt that message that as long as we're consistent with it, each of those little bits, and that's what I loved hearing about it, the small community of successes to show them, hey, here's how you can enjoy your hot chocolate. Here's how you can enjoy being able to incorporate these rather than saying this you can never have it anymore. That's really impactful for someone, especially for the memories that they might have with it. Like if they've had it as a kid, as a reward, shared it with their family members and is all a, a great collaborative time that when they say, oh, you can't have this anymore. It's like literally cutting off all of those positive memories that person has had with it, throwing it all out. And it's just saying that, like, how does that affect somebody? Yeah, it definitely brings down their morale. I had one patient who I was talking to them about organic versus inorganic phosphorus and how it's okay for them to eat beans. And, and they told me, I haven't had beans in 15 years since I started dialysis. And they were so excited to mm. go home, have some beans. And, but that broke my heart. I was like, oh my God, I can't imagine going so long without one of your staple cultural foods. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. It's like imagining your... And from my perspective, too, if someone says, hey, you can't have this, like they're constantly thinking about it now. Oh, now I really want this because everyone, there's a part of them that's if you tell them that we can't have something. A part of us is like, oh, you think that I can't have it? It's that challenging mm -hmm. perspective in the situation that they really want to try and get it now. So instead of <laughs> exactly then imagine uh, being in that patient's shoes where 15 years of not having what they want and every time that they see it. It's that conflicting thing of now they have a negative emotion or ties with it, but then all their past positive experiences that they still have tied with it, that it's very conflicting and it's just really demolarizing and really affects the psyche. Whereas instead, if we're able to say, no, let's show you how to have it appropriately. Let's look at the numbers, look at the brands, opening their mind to say, showing that you can have this despite being on dialysis to improve one's kidney health and those circumstances that you can have it. Let's be smart. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Lee. What has been the hardest lesson that you've learned since starting your journey as being a dietitian? And what did you learn from it? A big challenge for me was, I think, a part of you wants to come in and fix all their problems for them. And you think by giving you all of this information, this is going to solve everything. Some part of you is okay, this is what you need to know. And now it's not going to be a problem anymore. But learning that just how if somebody was trying to tell me something that I may, pro maybe probably should be doing, but following through with it might not be that easy. It's the same thing with my patients, right? So when I first came into dietetics, I wanted to teach them, have them change their life, and then move on. And mm -hmm. instead, when I would see them not making those changes, I had to really realize that you can't make, you can't make someone change, whether you present all this important information to them, that does not equal them following through with it. And one of the things I had to do to help with that was to learn more about motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. So that's something I was grateful for that in, in my job, they really do train you on and basically focusing on listening, validating, empathizing with the patient, meeting the patient where they're at. Some patients just are not ready to change. 
And some of the patients, especially if they're newer to dialysis, it's still not real for them. They're still mm -hmm. in that denial phase. So they're not going to be gung-ho about making these changes to their lives. So really listening for when they are ready and not giving up on the patient is very important because especially when you're in dialysis a long time and you see the same patient week after week, it's important that you don't just dismiss the patient like, oh, that patient is non-compliant. They're never going to listen. No, every week you still offer the information. You still engage with them. You still build that rapport and you still try because patients will surprise you. A patient that hasn't been doing well in a couple of years might suddenly all of a sudden have a new reason to change. Like mm -hmm. maybe, and this is just examples that have happened in the past. Like I've had patients that they needed to foster their grandchild. So now they felt, okay, I really need to get myself together so that I can be here for my family. So their motivation might change and now they might be more willing. Or let's say they're getting a little bit closer to getting their transplant. That's really going to help their motivation because now they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So mm -hmm. never giving up on that patient. I, I had a patient, I remember who never wanted to work on controlling his potassium. I saw him every week for maybe two years. And then finally, one day he was like, you know what? Let me listen to what you have to say. And was actually able to improve his potassium numbers. And I remember thinking, never in my life did I think <laughs> that this was going to happen, but the patients just surprise you. So even though it can be challenging for them not to make those immediate changes, to never give up because one day they might be ready. Yeah. And focusing on, keep on having that patience and focusing on keeping that door open. So when they are ready to change, we're ready to embrace them, welcome them in and have a good time. That's good. Ah, very thought-provoking insights, especially with the thoughts that people's motivators will shift and it may not lean towards wanting to make that immediate change. But once the fire burns up and their motivation is now well lit, well lit, they can just make that change instantly. Like sometimes with that patient that it took them two years, like it could be shorter for some people who are ready to make that change now mm -hmm. and just seeing the progress and seeing them really commit and go all into their health. It's such a rewarding experience and mm -hmm. always being there for them, no matter what ups or downs or those slopes are just saying, you got this. We believe in you when the time's ready, it could be now or it could be tomorrow. Like, we're ready for you to commit and really improve your health. <laughs> All right, Aureli, if you were to share one piece of advice to yourself when you first started your career and another piece of advice with someone of color who is recently diagnosed with diabetes and they are at risk of developing kidney disease, what would the pieces of advice be? For the first one, if I could speak to my younger self, I would definitely encourage them to, to network early, to reach out to the dietitians that they see and admire, and just from the very beginning, because over the course of my career, I feel like the biggest times that I've learned new information to help either with my business or with my patients, it's always been from dietitians that have already been there. Instead of making things harder for myself, it would have been better if just from the very beginning, you reach out to someone that is already there and try to implement what they did. It can be very meaningful. And sometimes it's really just who you are, the opportunities that you learn about, or I never even heard about Lahidan when I was a nutrition student, but there was a dietitian who I met at a conference. She was Hispanic and she told me, have you joined Lahidan? And I was like, no, what's that? And she's like, it's literally a whole organization about Latino dietitians. And I was like, that sounds amazing. So mm -hmm. just networking more with people that you think are making meaningful contributions. And then for someone who has diabetes of color and they're trying to prevent chronic kidney disease, I would say, if possible, try to work with a dietitian that is of your background. Because if you work with someone that doesn't understand the nuances of your culture and your holidays and your foods, it's going to be harder to make, not impossible, but harder to make a plan that you can stick to versus whether versus 
if you're talking to someone that knows where you're coming from and can sense certain pitfalls ahead of time, they might be able to help you better control your diabetes so that it doesn't get to chronic kidney disease. Or even if you are in um, the early stages of chronic kidney disease, there's so much that you can do to help prevent dialysis or at least delay it for a longer time. So working with someone of your background can really show you, okay, these are the cultural foods that are already in your diet. This is how we're going to include them to help prevent that kidney disease or hopefully delay dialysis for as long as possible. Wonderful insights, especially with telling yourself, hey, get connected with people so that you can learn more about amazing opportunities. And then to the other person to say, hey, work with someone who really understands your situation. And if someone isn't available, then hey, that's why you're listening to this podcast so that I could show amazing guests who can understand your cultural background because they lived it to help you succeed. If not, then finding someone who can listen, really listen, who can see what you're trying to achieve and being there so that they can understand how you feel to accomplish the goals that you want for a healthier life and being able to live a lot longer. So instead of being able to have more years instead of putting more like life into those years to have a richer meaningful experience so good <laughs> thank you for sharing and thank you all right what would you say has been the most rewarding experience when you have been serving on the lahida i cannot say that right. how do you say it again so i can get this right on record <laughs> lahidan lahidan yeah what's been the most rewarding experience when you've been serving on Lahidan? Uh, I've really enjoyed even just meeting and networking with these fellow uh, Hispanic and Latino Latina dietitians. That part has been a lot of fun and sharing in those similarly to us in the beginning when you were talking about, yes, I understand what it's like to be first generation. Yes, I understand the financial barriers. Yes, I understand. So just having people that you can relate to on all those levels is really nice. And then helping the Latino community, especially students, like I mentioned. So right now I'm the nomination chair elect. So what we're involved in is scholarships and finding candidates for next year's leadership. And so getting more Latino and Latina dietitians involved in Lahidan has been very important for me. So I've reached out to dietitians that I know, like friends of mine that are Hispanic and ask them like, hey, consider joining. This is what we're doing. This is our mission. And I've gotten a few people to, so I'm, I'm growing that community for, and that support system for other Hispanic and Latino, Latina dietitians. And then being able to go through that scholarship application selection process and helping one student make it to Fancy, which is like the Super Bowl for dietitians. It's our <laughs> So it can be very pricey, especially for someone that's a student. So helping get one student to fancy and helping reward dietitians that are making meaningful contributions to the Hispanic and Latino community, that has been very rewarding. Mm. So being able to give them that opportunity to say, hey, we know that the investment to make for these opportunities, not everyone may have the opportunity to do. And providing that bridge to say, when you're willing to invest into yourself by committing to these roles and being able to connect with other like-minded individuals to make a positive impact in this world, that we can sponsor you to go to these opportunities. Very mm -hmm. awesome. Because <laughs> we can do more together. I have um, other dietitians in Lahidan that I've talked to about how important it is to have our own conference because I think a lot of students and other dietitians would really benefit from that is having a conference just literally geared towards helping the Hispanic community and, and helping other Hispanic and Latino dietitians. So that's something that we've started working on for the future. And I'm, I'm just excited because if we have the manpower, we can make amazing things happen. Mm, sounds awesome. <laughs> I can't wait to see how big that is too and just seeing the highlights as well because I'm sure there will be some dancing that's involved and some awesome food that's going to be shown in those conferences <laughs> and I would love to see those highlights. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm a Zumba instructor and I've already uh, taught a class for the organization. So I'm sure there'll be more. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Happy to hear about that. <laughs> All right. So getting close to the end of this interview, and I always love to ask these fun questions. Aredi, what is your zombie apocalypse survival plan? I don't know if survival, when I thought of that question, my first thought is I would probably just come to the other side and like experience and embrace this new life as a zombie and okay. then <laughs> learn about the different types of flavors from the different brains that I'll be <laughs> The brain states different based on the person's intelligence or background. Like... <laughs> She's going to convert immediately just to figure yes. out what brings us the best. I'll start a podcast about being a zombie. Oh my God. Different types of <laughs> so this is what a brain from South America tastes like. This is what a brain from this place tastes like. This is what a mm -hmm. brain who has been someone who got a PhD tastes like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> She's changing the survival plan to just a food eating guide now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. And then the next thing I want to ask is what is your ideal like full course meal? So a beverage of choice, appetizer, main course, dessert, any side dishes that you want. Oh my goodness. What would be my last oh. <laughs> if you want to call it that way <laughs> oh man okay I think you know what I'm I would probably go the more sentimental route my favorite food in the world is my mom's milanesa so the flank steak that's breaded and fried oh that's, yeah so I would have my mom's milanesa probably mashed potatoes with cream gravy because that's my favorite side to drink we'll go with a Kolsch beer and then for dessert I would have a brownie a la mode mm. Mm -hmm. all sounds delicious especially with the the fried flank steak that sounds amazing <laughs> <laughs> in my mouth watering <laughs> yeah, that was always my birthday food oh amazing <laughs> i'm sure the quinceanera was also amazing too probably one of the best ever <laughs> 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 all right Aureli, it has been such an honor and a pleasure having you on this podcast and i'm sure the listeners the watchers people who listen to this watch this or really felt your message they want to find where you're at connect with you what is the best way for people to find you? My Instagram is at Latina Kidney Dietitian. That is also my newly launched website. So www.latinakidneydietitian.com. My podcast is Food Culture Curious, which is on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. And that's also the Instagram is at Food Culture Curious and TikTok. Mm -hmm. if awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And I can't wait to hear more about the successes that you'll have and sharing it, of course. And of course, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate your support. And if you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this podcast, tag them in this, share it with them. And as always, everyone, make one small change today, whether that is getting a little bit more sunshine or taking one extra step today to improve your health, to live a longer, healthier life, do that today. Without further ado, we'll see y'all next time for the next episode.